Before I get into the details of how to study for the uh, FE exam, Civil Geotechnical Section, I want to make a couple of, uh, just a brief outline really of my approach to it and the approach that I've commended to my students over the years. And basically there are many people when they approach studying for this, urge their um, people to solve a lot of sample problems. And I, I think that's a good idea after you've looked at what I'm about to present to you. However, in the case of you know the beforehand situation, I think there's a uh, there's something else you need to do, and that's something else, and that's what I'm going to discuss today is know your cheat sheet. By cheat sheet, I mean the little booklet or PDF file that NCES furnishes you as the only reference you're allowed to take into this exam. And the reason for that is through the nature of geotech. Uh, many of your other disciplines, you could use your knowledge of mechanics and physics to get through a lot of it. Geotech, however, is a lot of specific earth science types of things. And as a result, you don't, you're not really able to, to do it that way. Um, you have, there's a lot of, and that's one reason why I've never used anything but open book test uh, for my courses. And that doesn't necessarily mean that my tests are easier. That just means they're open book. But there's no way of memorizing a lot of this. At least it's very difficult to do that unless you use it all the time. So with that in mind, um, you have to, you know, so you need to understand what's in there. Because that gives you an idea of what the questions are going to be asking you. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to go through that. I'm not going to be able to use the graphics on screen for copyright reasons, but the material I'm going to cover is going to be the cheat sheet material, and I'm going to cover in the order they present it. So I would strongly suggest that you get a copy of that and put it next to the video or whatever you're doing while you're watching this so you can actually relate the two. Uh, over the, the years, my courses, have, I've geared my courses to reflect what's in the exam. And I know many teachers find it very disturbing that you would actually um, gear, gear students to taking a test. Well, that, you know, that may be disturbing to some of you. In this case, I don't think it's really bad because the geotech you have in the FE exam is pretty basic, what I call NAFAC DM7, and I'll use a lot of that material, type of geotech engineering. So there's nothing really exotic about it. And as you know, so, you know, that's pretty much what, what we're going to be covering today. It has worked over the years. Uh, my, the geotech scores that my students have on the exam has, Im has improved from when I first started doing it this way. And I think that you will find this a more satisfying approach than some of just solving lots of problems. Because one of the things that it does is geotech is a fairly broad field, and the, and the cheat sheet gives you an idea of what kind of questions you're going to have to encounter on the exam. And so that that's also a very good thing to know. So um, also for my students and for everyone, if you will find, since because thanks to COVID, all of my lectures in soil mechanics and all my lectures in foundations are now out there on the web. So if you have any, such, any topics here that you're weak at and want to, more explanation, it's out there for you. So I will be able, I can explain that. So without any further ado, let's get into going through the NCES booklet, which I notoriously call the cheat sheet. Let's start our look at the uh, quote-unquote cheat sheet. Actually, it's my version of it. I'm going to go through it in the same order which it appears in the book. So you can follow along with the reference book, which you need to download 
anyway to look at and know what you've got at your disposal before you start. So let's get let's get started. First topic: weight and volume relationships. And weight and volume relationships are basically driven by two premises. One of them is that the total weight is equal to the weight of the solids, don't confuse that with the soil, plus the weight of the water. Air is assumed weightless for our purposes. And the other side of that is that the three volumes, the volume of the solid, the volume of the water, and the volume of the air or gas are equal to zero. And those three, you could, you can solve any phase problem, that's what these are called, based upon those two assumptions. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend that students do that. It's too computationally intensive. You get bogged down too quick. And not only that, but you end up having, if you are given stuff like porosity or void ratio or um, you know, you move on to moisture content, which is very common, degree of saturation, specific gravity, quantities like that, then you can spend an enormous amount of time in problems like this. These relationships, which you see on this page and the one before it, are relationships which have been developed over the years. And the cheat sheet gives you uh, a nice little summary of these. Uh, the only pro this is a very comprehensive one from NAFAC DM7, but it's a little too comprehensive in some ways. Uh, it, it does everything, but sometimes if you're in a hurry, it's hard to get to where you want to go uh, if you're not just very familiar with it. So I would suggest that you look at the relationships and get used to them and be able to solve for things. Um, using those relationships, particularly relationships such as particular um, things such as the very important ones include the dry, wet, saturated, and submerged unit weights. Uh, those states you need to understand completely uh, because sometimes it's easy to get tripped up that the wet unit weight and the saturated unit weight are the same. They are not. Um, a completely saturated sample has no air voids at all and all the voids are filled with water. Whereas with a wet unit weight you can have all three you, and do have all three states. Solid, you have water, and you have air. You know? So they're, in dry unit weight you have just air. Um, Another one is the submerged or buoyant unit weight, which is equal to the saturated unit weight minus the unit weight of the water. And that's used, uh, that's only valid hydrostatically, and that can be used with, um, with you can use those with your effective stress, which we'll get into that here in a little bit. Uh, other important uh, Moisture content is very important, or water content. Generally, for geotechnical purposes, moisture content and water content are the same. Uh, and you know, unless you've got an environmental issue, they should they they should be the uh, they will be the same. Uh, the degree of saturation, um, sat soils which are dry have. Um, no water has that degrees of zero. Saturated samples have a unity. Specific gravity. It's very important to note that the specific gravity is an expression of density. It is not an expression of the density of the total soil uh, sample. Because there's an important distinction we make, and don't forget it, between the solids, the particles themselves, and the soil, which also includes the water and the air in there. Don't make don't don't get those confused. That's an easy confusion to make. Don't do that. Uh, make sure that when you're they're asking you the weight of the solids, the weight of the soil, they're not talking about the same things or the volume of the solids or the volume of the soil. They're not talking about the same thing. 
and so um, the uh, degree of you know, specific gravity is the specific gravity or the or is an expression of the density of the solids just the particles themselves uh, those are very important another pair of numbers that are very important are the void ratio and the porosity the void ratio and the porosity are basically functions of each other and the, and the formulas are given I think they give you I think one of those at least are, is in the cheat sheet um, and their their functions for every void ratio there is a porosity um, and vice versa and so um, you need to, to under, make sure you understand the difference one other thing that I the void ratio is the ratio of the volume of the voids to the volume of the solids not the volume of the voice of the total volume total that is porosity that's the difference between porosity and void ratio they're both expressions of the void volume but their ratio of different things you can actually see that very clearly so be um cognizant of that fact another fact that i should mention is the fact that the water content is the weight of the water over the weight of the solids it is not the weight of the water over um, the total weight of the sample so don't make that mistake either you need to get familiar with the formulas you have and know how to use them and to and the most important key to doing that right is to know your definitions but to know what's what in other words what's the what are the solids what is their volume with their weight you know also the weight of the the dry unit weight and the weight of the solids of any sample is identical uh, they're you're talking about the same thing between the two of them one other thing i'm going to mention about volume and weight relationships before i move on if you look carefully at this formula and I, the formulas in the cheat sheet i think are pretty much the same they're all based upon unit weight and um they uh uh and it, and we unit what well, unit weights i either mean unit weights in pounds force or killing it and generally speaking that's the way we're supposed to do it at least in, in this country at least um, that's the way we're supposed to do our um, or you know to, to, to do it and that's the way that I have always taught it that way however we need to be aware of the fact that of uh, some parts and I've act and the only reason why I really make a deal out of this is because of the FE exam because I have seen sample problems where they quote you the unit the the instead of the unit weight of the sample they quote you the unit mass or the density of the sample now here again make sure that you understand that the density of the soil and the density of the solids is not the same and they usually do this with usually do this with kilograms per cubic meter as their measurement of density occasionally you'll see gram per cubic centimeters you just shove the decimal point over between one and the other but for on the FE exam I have seen sample problems where they actually did in kilograms per cubic meter these formulas are applicable uh, some students will try to convert them into the uh, unit weight that's really strictly speaking the way you're supposed to do it but that's a good way of getting confused and one thing we don't want is confusion so basically what you would do you see all the little gamma w's and um, you see the gamma d's and you see all those simply substitute rho in there for example instead of gamma water you'd have the rho of the water which is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter uh, the gamma D is whatever kilogram per cubic meter dry weight it is and that's especially important with compaction problems and that sort of thing don't try to convert 
become familiar with doing it both ways. And you'll, and I say, I've seen that in sample problems, and you should be aware of that. So that is a very important part. Uh, it really, that, that's where some practice problems will be very useful to you. And you can go back and look at some of the, the things that I've got and many of the, um, the textbooks that I offer and whatnot. I have some, a, a fair number of practice problems. I, one thing I'll make mention of is that Veroit, the Ver, Veroit's book has the answers to all of its problems in the back. So you can use that for sample problems. So those are, most of those are pretty basic, although some of them are tricky and require thought, but you can expect problems like that on the FE exam. One quantity that need, I need to talk about is relative density. Relative density is a ratio. It is a ratio of the difference between, and, and if you recall from, uh, and Veroit's presentation on this is very nice, you have spheres packed in a, in a in say they're in a jar or something like that. And how much there, you know, the, the void ratio, there's a maximum void ratio and a minimum void ratio, depending upon what, um, you know, how they're packed. For example, the maximum void ratio is the maximum volume of voids for given spheres in the loosest condition. And then the minimum is the void ratio in the densest condition. And somewhere between the maximum and the minimum is what you actually have in your soil. So the relative density is a measure of where the density is between the loosest state and the densest state. And this is used very frequently with cohesionless soils. And that is um, uh, also... It is also possible to define it differently, and I'm putting the different difference there, and that difference is definitely on your cheat sheet. It is in terms of dry density or dry unit weight. Uh, and I put density on the slides, but you could just use unit weight just as easily uh, because all your GCCs cancel out in this definition. It's a little more complicated mathematically. Uh, for people who use it in compactive um, work, it's a little easier to use because dry density or dry unit weight is very important for compactive work. Very important. And actually, you talk about the moisture content versus dry unit weight chart in compaction problems. And so, uh, there's the, the equation for that. Um, this, this is an important, and this is this could be the only thing you gotta be really careful about here is making sure you know your e max. The fact of the matter is, is that the e max and the e min uh, are reversed from the gamma max and gamma min. Uh, in other words, the e max corresponds to the gamma d min and vice versa. So be careful about that. Make sure you read your problem carefully and to make sure what you're doing. Another quantity is relative compaction. And relative compaction is basically the ratio of the um, of the unit weight, the dry unit weight you actually get in the field during compaction process and the maximum possible which you get out of the Proctor compaction test. And it's usually expressed in a percentage. Very frequently what we'll do instead of using the equation that way is we'll have the gamma d field is equal to RC times gamma d max, which is what we expect the contractor to do. We don't expect the contractor to hit our, you know, ideal maximum for a long list of reasons. Um, but we, we can't, you know, it's a fairly, but um, we do expect him or her to, to hit the uh, uh, gamma d field um, as slightly reduced from that maximum. And so you'll, you'll get problems like that. And you'll need to, one thing to make sure is generally speaking, the relative compaction is, is a function of the dry unit weight. 
make sure when you're dealing with compaction problems, you work with dry unit weights. That concludes the first part of it. The next part, we're kind of shifting towards gradation. And, then, and ultimately, we're going to um, come back to that when we get to um, gradation and plasticity. And gradation and plasticity are the basis for both of our, um, our soil classification systems. Both the Ashto and the Unified are based upon determining these two. The effective diameter, the D10, is basically uh, the point at which 10% of the, um, uh, the where 10% of the um, uh, of the particles are smaller than that particular size, and that size is always in millimeters. D10, D30. D60, D85, you name it, that's always in, in millimeters. And um, the D30, 60, 85, again, the D30 is all the, the particles which are smaller than the, than, um, than that, the, the, in other words, the 30% of the particles are smaller than that particular grain size. D60 or 60% 60 of the particles are smaller than that particular grain size. And 85 is 85% of the particles are smaller than that particular grain size. And you would guess that the, as you go up in, you know, from D10 to D30, 60, the particle size becomes larger. Of, of the, the D, the actual number become, will, will increase. I've got some charts on some of my slides and whatnot, which actually have a graph representation on that. I won't go into that. Um, they do not furnish you such charts on, in the FE exam. There are other, you take those and you use those in the coefficient of uniformity, which is simply with D60 over D10. Both of those are in millimeters, remember. And the coefficient of curvature, that's CZ, usually called CC, which is equal to D30 squared over D10 times D60. And both of those are used for classification of um, cohesionless and, and coarse grain soils. On the other end, you've got your Atterberg limits or your plasticity characteristics, and there are three of those, uh, which we encounter on the FE exam. The liquid limit, the LL, um, the plastic limit, or PL, and the plasticity in this, which is the difference of the two. It's, it's most important to um, make sure that you, you under, when you read your problem, read, read your problem carefully, and make sure that you're not um, you're you're not going you're not they're, they're not asking for the plasticity index when in fact you're playing on giving the plastic limit vice versa. Don't get those two confused. It's a very easy mistake to make. Permeability. A nice little summary here of permeability. Uh, it is the, the the K value, the coefficient of permeability, which um, is basically is the factor of proportion now relating to the rate of fluid discharge per unit of cross-sectional area. Some of you on your problems ask me what's the area. Well, it's a per unit area thing uh, of the hydraulic based on the hydraulic gradient. There are three quantities there which I want to to note. First is the one in the middle, QA is equal to HK over L. In other words, H is the head difference between point A and point B. And that can depend upon, um, uh, and, and that depends, of course, on how, on, on again, how much hydraulic head or how much uh, potential is being put on the, um, on the soil. The, K is the coefficient of permeability, and L is the length, is the physical length through which it, it, the fluid traverses for that given head drop. Um, on the right, I rewrite the equation a little differently. Um, and on the left is the hydraulic gradient, which is I, which is equal to H over L. Or actually, it's delta H over delta L to be more 
precise about it. I kept it that way to try to keep um, don't take it, to try to keep it consistent with what's in front of you. So make sure you understand those completely. Um, it, it, permeability is simple to state and yet difficult to implement in your calculations. So be careful. Two implementations that will come up on many tests is first of all the constant head permeability test and basically this is the running a sample through a uh, running a fluid through a tr sample usually trapped in a cylinder and you measure the head differential across two points in the sample and that becomes your um, L um, and the H you have the head loss and length and the rest of those generally speaking um, one thing I have taken out of this from my slides is the R, the temperature factor. Mostly for the FE exam, you don't need to worry about the temperature factor in your um, your calculations. So um, that's pretty much um, it for those. Those problems are fairly straightforward, and most students do pretty well on them. Take the temperature out; it's very one thing that um, constant permeability tests assume is the so-called bucket um, flow measurement technique where you measure a quantity of flow in cc's or whatever over an elapsed time in second. Uh, you could go to a continuous, you know, little Q, you know, Q kind of approach, but usually if you're running a constant permeability test, you don't do that. You use a bucket type of approach. Uh, falling head permeability test is where you put a standpipe in a pad of soil usually uh, for you know constant head tests are good for granular soils where the permeability is fairly high when you get low it takes too long to do it that way you use this formula uh, again I've, I've taken out the temperature factor here um, the cross-sectional makes one of the things you have to be careful of is the fact you've got two cross-sectional areas in this thing. You've got the inside of the standpipe, which is usually very small, and the cross-sectional of the specimen, which is usually very large. Um, and then you've got an elapsed time from TF, and you actually do as you set it up, you fill the tube, the, the standpipe with water and watch it drop, which is um, uh, similar to like a percolation test, or sometimes you can get rising head tests to go the other way. Um, but that's not really germane to the FE exam. Again, it's a matter of reading your problem carefully, recognize that they've done a falling head permeability test, plug and chug properly. And that's how you, um, you do that. Um, those, again, are fairly straightforward. And most students, in my experience, they do pretty well on those. Another one is flow nets. Now, the biggest problem I've had, and I put this diagram up because I want, because it, this is the and best diagram, it's the one I use in class. Um, and I found out the reason why is because it shows you clearly how to count, how to count your um, uh, flow, your equipotential drops, and your flow channels. This shows you clearly how to do that. Uh, you've got, on the one hand, you've got, uh, for example, look on the, on the on the one on the right, you've got four flow channels. And they count, they number those, and you can count those. And D8 is uh, the jet potential drops. Normally in, in an FE exam, very much like I do in class, they give you a flow net and ask you to interpret it. And... Usually it's a conventional um, uh, square, squ the squares are square for purposes of analysis and um, you, can, you can use, but the key there is to count. This is where most students fall down badly in some cases. They don't count their, their drops, they don't count their flow channels, they don't count their drops. This shows you in vivid terms how to do that. And then you take that information 
and to to compute the flow from one side of a dam or a sheet piling wall or whatever to another um, you simply t use this formula the NF and the ND you just put those right in um, elevation difference between the upstream and downstream you can see that um, by the um, difference between the headwater and the tailwater um, the, the, the length and they'll, use, they'll give that to you um, and that's it and then the K the um, which is the um, permeability coefficient and that's it a lot of students want to overcomplicate this don't just don't one thing I want to mention and with permeability before I move on to something else before I move on to other other things is um, problems where you've got upward flow um, and, and this is actually this is a good introduction upward flow in a sample in other words you've got a, a confined sample and you've got upward flow you, they, they ask you to determine the hydraulic gradient between point A and point B um, I, the only re the reason why I include this in the course is because I've actually seen it on in FE sample problems and I want you to be prepared for it. The only way I would suggest if you're having trouble had trouble with that to review those to review my materials online on the subject. That leads me of course to soil boiling and the critical gradient. The critical gradient is uh, equal to um, the saturated unit weight only happens saturated soil is over the unit weight of water minus one or the submerged unit weight over the unit weight of water. That is the critical gradient. You get a gradient past that, you're going to have soil coming up on you. And this is for upward flow. The egg, and, that, and I see in the exit gradient is, where the, is the gradient where the water fl flowing through a net exits. In other words, if you've got, let me go back. If you look on the right hand side of all those sheet piling walls the exit between D and E the letters is your exit area and the, the um, usually the critical point is right under the letter D where you get your uh, you, you would get your lowest you would get your highest hydraulic gradients and the factor of safety against seepage is equal to the critical hydraulic gradient over the gradient that you have and you use you compute that gradient using the formulas that we looked at earlier. And we'll just go back and check those out. Uh, that one right, delta H over delta L. And that, in a nutshell, is permeability on the FE exam. Now we turn to primary consolidation settlement. Um, the um, ultimate consolidation settlement, again, we're, the, the FE exam, and, and they've changed some of this over the years, in, in the, um, but generally speaking, in, in this case, the FE exam only concerns itself with primary consolidation settlement. It doesn't get into secondary consolidation settlement, and it doesn't get into um, elastic settlement. We do, um, in fact, I notice at the bottom, you've got um, the stress increase. Now, what is that? The consolidation settlement is induced when a compressible stratum, which you can see in that diagram on the right, has an additional load applied on it by usually you, um, and the water wants to escape. And that's what create and the and the void ratio drops from them, but the stress increase um, is equal to the I. Now the I is the influence coefficient. You recall from um, your boost and S problems, uh, I is the um, influence coefficient of the surface. In other words, that if you have a finite load on the surface. And it applies, um, it, you know, it, it goes into the soil. 
then the stress increase is equal to I times whatever uniform load is on that surface. And that depends what's the circle square or whatever, or strip load or whatever it is. So I have not seen the Boussinex charts in some time in the FE exam. I'm not sure whether um, they used to be. We had, they had them there, and we actually discussed them. Um, they do not do that anymore. Um, the ultimate consolidation in the soil layer, on the other hand, is equal to the strain you put on this times the thickness of the layer, which is the HS, uh, or the HT in the, di in, in the diagram. And um, the um, normally speak, and this is something we've gotten to avoid, I'm not really sure what they're trying to accomplish here, but you remember in Verroit talked about that some places in the world prefer to use strain and some use void ratio and in the U.S. void ratio um, is pretty much the, it, it is done whereas in places like the in like Netherlands and places like that um, they use strain. Strain, the next equation relates strain to void ratio. The strain that you have is equal to the change of void ratio over 1 plus the initial void ratio. So, and of course the strain, like everywhere else, is equal to delta H, the change in height over the original height. That's engineering strain. Um, you'll notice in the lower right-hand corner, for normally consolidated soils, you have the, the um, um, uh, th that is the classic, um, so that, that is the classic for normal consolidated soils. The compression takes place after you get into the virgin region. In other words, looking at that chart, you get past point C or point E. You get to the right of that, you're in, the, you're, you're in virgin territory. And therefore, that's where your compression takes place. And that is equal to the, uh, that equation in the bottom. Usually, that, that equation is written for multi-layer problems. I don't see you're going to get, you might get a multi-layer problem, but you may want to solve one layer at a time, in which case you need to make sure you know what layer you're looking at. Um, it is equal to uh, the C, the compression index, which I'll get into in a second, uh, over 1 plus the void ratio, times the thickness, the original thickness of the layer, which we already discussed, times the log 10, Make sure your calculate you punch log 10 rather than your natural log of the PF. The PF, as you see, is equal to the initial effective stress plus whatever stress you add to it. And I actually discussed about that stress here in the previous slide. Delta P is equal to IQS. And they may and actually what they may do is they may give you if they give you a uniform surcharge, I is equal to unity, and QS and delta P are the same. So be prepared for that. Um, the PF is the final effective stress at the center layer, and then the P0 is the initial effective stress at the layer. You may be asked to do an effective stress analysis on a layer, and we, we're going to talk about that. Uh, compression index can be derived. For, you can, there are a couple of ways they may ask you to get one of them. They may ask you to compute the compression index. Compression index is equal to the for a given area. Say, for example, let's look at this diagram. Say we want to find the compression index. Well, you see it's marked out. It's equal to the void, the change of the void, the change in the void ratio, say point E and point D, over the change in the log pressure, log 10 pressure, between point E and point D. So for E and D, for the void ratio, you would look at the, you know, you project those points back on the y-axis, and the delta log p, you would project those on the log of the x-axis. And that's how you compute. Generally speaking, if you're given empirical data, the only correlation I've ever seen in the FE exam is that one. And that's one we've used, we used in class. It's the most common for clays of you know, normal sensitivity. One of the really tricky parts I've seen in the last five years is the inclusion of pre
pre-consolidated soils. And this is a complicated thing. And if you're shaky on this, I would suggest you go back and look at my videos and slides on the issue. Um, and we, uh, um, you know, for the for if you are if you know, first of all, you've got to find out where you're at. In a chart, you look at that chart. If your final pressure, if the final pressure you've added, the the, uh, the delta P puts you over between past F, then you use the first formula. You have to do. It's a two-stage process where you compress it from B to F, and that's the first term of the equation, and then you go from F to wherever you end up, and that's the second term. If you are between B and F, then you use the second equation. Some important things. One, and I've goofed this up already, I can see, because of C sub S and C sub R, they're the same. My apologies for not fixing that before I, I got started here, but, but C sub S and C sub R are the same. That is the recompression index. For the purpose of, of, of your FE exam is equal to C sub C over 6. Make sure when you take the first term, you plug in C sub S or C sub R. Again, they're the same. And then uh, delta then H. And then the second term, C sub C, the normal um, version compression index. Make sure you don't get those backwards or you'll get into trouble. But, may, but really, may, the first thing you've got to do is to make sure what region your, act, your compression actually stops. And does it stop between B and F or does it stop past F? That's the important question you've had to answer first. Then you can worry about the rest of it. Once you compute the settlement, that's a distance calculation. I sh probably should have reminded you of this, but this is a good time once you're transitioning. We have two things going on in consolidation settlement. We have uh, something going on in distance and something going on with time. There are two quantities that we need to, um, to emphasize. One of them is the time factor, which is equal to the time of consolidation, time when you start consolidating, time you stop. And <clears throat> theoretically, uh, consolidation settlement never finishes. In practical terms, it does. And sometimes we would like to know how far it gets at a certain time. For example, if it's going to consolidate, if you know, we figure it's going to be mostly done in five years, we might want to know what it's going to have, have in one, two, three, and four years. So... That's that time. The uh, time for vertical drainage, time factor for vertical drainage is a dimensionless factor. Um, the HDR is the longest distance between, um, uh, between the previous day. I'm going to explain that in a second. The C sub V is the coefficient of consolidation, which is not the same. The second thing is the degree of consolidation, which is equal to the... Um, the consolidation at some time and S of C, which is consolidation when it's quote unquote finished, which I just said never was about that. Um, so um, that is it's the ratio of the two. And also it, it can be expressed in terms of poor water pressures as well. Um, the initial, you know, the... Um, Basically, what's going on, and this is a good way of, of illustrating it, um, you see the consolidation ratio. You see, uh, they used to put in the FE exam the poor water pressure decrease, but most of our problems don't concern that. We're actually assuming a uniform dis distribution of poor water pressure. The real kicker is right there in the middle of that diagram on the left. Uh, HDR is equal to the maximum distance water must travel to get out of a layer. If it's one-way drainage, if you have an impervious layer below, be that a clay or rock or whatever, and you've got sand above it, then uh, the time it then the distance is the complete thickness of the layer. Two-way drainage. Um, HDR is half of that because it can make it can head to the exits either going up 
or going down. That's an important thing. You got to watch that because if you don't, then as you can see from this formula, you can vary your answer can vary uh, by a factor of four. Uh, and I can guarantee you that the, the, the clever people over in the upstate of South Carolina that put these things together are going to present you one of the answers with HDR different from what you're actually doing. So be careful. Um, now that table is, is the one out of our Souls and Foundations manual, which, which I use in class. Um, is the U versus TV. It basically ties together U, which is on the right here, and TV, which is on the left. That's how they, you tie them together. The FE exam now has a much more detail, which will eliminate probably most, if not all, of the um, linear interpolation that you might be tempted to do. So, uh, for a given T, if you compute, for example, a time a T sub V using that equation, you can then U using that equation and that u is the percent so for example if my final say is six inches and I, my t sub v is 0.197 then the u is 50 percent and u and 50 percent times six is three inches so it's it's settled three inches and that whatever time period that it took and whatever time period that i uh, picked More Coulomb failure. Um, the slanted line you see on the uh, on there is the more Coulomb failure surface, and the equation for that is tau, the shear stress, the y-axis, is equal to c plus sigma, which is usually the vertical effective stress times the sine of phi which is the phi is the friction angle and C is the cohesion. Normally this is associated with either triaxial test uh, or unconfined compression test in the case of phi is equal to zero. But in any event you need to be able to read the Moore diagram. That is the failure surface. If those if we run a triaxial test for example and the failure and the and the and the more circle that comes out of that Sigma 3 is usually the confining stress or the, or the effective stress, and sigma 1 is the stress at which the sample failed. If that circle gets out beyond, gets above that slanted line, you have experienced, you've already experienced failure. If it touches it, you are at the failure point. Uh, one thing that they like to talk about is mean normal stress. That is simply sigma 1 plus sigma 3 over 2. Uh, I'm not going to go in in this particular and how you compute principal stresses using more circle. That is something I'm going to leave for the mechanics and materials people. Uh, that is covered in that part of the booklet. Stresses in soils, the sigma n is a total normal stress in your book, in fact, has the formula tau is equal to c plus sigma n sine phi. Normally that, it, it, that, that is generally the, what we're talking about when we talk about that. And the normal stress is, guess what, p over a. How about that? And then shear stress is t over a, which t is the sh a shearing force. Those probably would be useful if they give you a problem concerning a, a triaxial test where you've got a round specimen with a definite cross-sectional area or a shear stress or a direct shear test, something like that. Um, you compute those and then you use the more circle to solve your problem. Uh, sigma prime is the effective stress. We've talked about kind of danced around it. Sigma prime is equal to the total stress which is equal to, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, uh, minus uh, the poor water pressure. And usually for, and, and, the, and that equation comes out of the cheat sheet, that basically means usually, but not always, but generally speaking, that's a hydrostatic 
uh, for most effective stress problems, we generally deal in hydrostatic. Sometimes we will have moving water, and we talked about that in permeability, and, but most of the time it will be a hydrostatic stress. Now we come to vertical and horizontal pressures in soils. One of the nice things that the FE book has always done is to combine the uh, presentation on vertical stresses with that of horizontal ones. Now, and I'm talking about, in this case, stresses based upon the weight of the soil and the weight of the water. And that's, that's really a good thing because they're definitely tied together. They're definitely related to one another, and, you, and the sooner you realize that relationship, the better. So I'm going to look at this diagram that actually presents both, and it's a little more complicated than the one in the, in the cheat sheet, but it will, get, it will illustrate what I'm trying to do. First, you've got three soils. Those three soils have, um, um, have three different sets of properties, and the second layer is split by the water table. As I remember, you, as I remember the, usually the water table always splits the soil. Um, small layer to two. You've got four Z's. You start out with, and we're talking about no surcharge servers. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the vertical pressure diagram starts out with the sigma V, which is the uh, total stress, is equal to sigma prime V, the effective stress, plus the water, plus the, the um, um, poor water pressure. If you were to rearrange that, sigma V minus U is equal to sigma prime V, you would have the very familiar equation I just showed you in the previous slide. First one's pretty simple. You come down to at the bottom of soil 1 is equal to gamma 1 times Z1. Good. Then you go down to the next point, gamma V is equal to that plus gamma 2 Z2. At this point, things start to diverge. Because what happens is we keep computing the total stress, the total up to up to the water table, the total stress and the effective stress are the same. But after that, they start diverging, and they diverge by that shaded area. I guess that's what you call it. Whereas the total stress it continues to build faster than the effective stress because of the buoyant effect of the water. You sub at each of those points, you subtract u at that point. For example, at the bottom of Z3 layer, at bottom of soil 2, you've got u is equal to gamma w, the u away of the water, times Z3, the, the distance from the water table down there. And the uh, then you again use some uh, sigma v would equal there, sigma 1 z1 plus sigma 2 z2 plus sigma 3, I mean, excuse me, gamma 1 z1 plus gamma 2 z2 plus um, gamma 3 z3 and then you subtract that and you get sigma v at that point. Keep in mind that one of the assumptions in any layering scheme is that the unit weight is the same. Therefore, for any layering scheme, the um, um, the, 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 you draw lines between the points. So the key to any, to any effective stress problem is figuring out what the effective stress at the boundaries of the layers are. Because once you know that, then you know you can it literally linear interpolate between the two. You can average the two for the one in the middle, uh, which you use in consolidation problems very frequently. Um, effective, and then you go again, the bottom one at the bottom of Z4 is equal to the sum of those sigma Vs minus the pore water pressure at the bottom, which would equal to actually gamma W times Z3 plus Z4. So that's your vertical pressure. And it's pretty much what we've done, we did in, in, in class. Horizontal pressure has got, there are two problems. Or actually, there are more than two problems, but the, the, the biggest problems, biggest problem is the fact that, first of all, you have to apply a K to it. Now, you'll notice in the transition between the vertical pressure and the horizontal pressure, you get some wacky little discontinuities like at the bottom of Z1 or at the bottom of Z3 you get a discount. The reason for that is because K is going to vary from one soil to the next. 
Um, in some cases, some people will just blow through and just assign the same K to all of them. And if they can get away from it, um, then they can, then everybody can just live happily ever after. But, you know, usually they don't. It, you may have a different K between the layers. But again, no matter whether you've got different Ks or not, whether those discontinuities appear, the, um, the, the, you still compute the um, horizontal effective stress is, I mean, horizontal pressure at any of those points is equal to whatever K, you know, the lateral earth pressure coefficient is, exists in that layer times the vertical stress. that you can put your vertical stresses and then you compute your horizontal stresses. Ideally, that would make sense to do it that way. There are two trouts in the milk, and this diagram shows the big ones. First, un unbalanced hydrostatic forces. And I teach the, and they do actually and these are definitely a possibility. Look at the P water. You'll notice that this wall has nothing on the right side. It's just all soil and this surcharge on the left side, and it's got water on the right side. It's got nothing on the right side. If the water table is not repl if there's a different water table on left and right side, or there's no water table on one side, then you've got an unbalanced hydrostatic force starting from the water table down to wherever the water is on both sides. In this case, it isn't. So therefore, that is an unbalanced force that has to be added to the earth pressure forces that you have. That's one thing. So don't miss an unbalanced hydrostatic force. And the other one is that you have called Q, a uniform surge. Now this is a concept which for some reason induces panic in many students. I'm not, I, basically the only different, what you would do, if you've got an unbalanced, you basically, in terms of vertical effective stresses, all it does, instead of start, you know, you look at the previous diagram and they all start at zero. Well, if you've got an unbalanced hydrostat, unbalanced, um, if you've, got, if you've got, excuse me, unbalanced, I'm, I'm losing my place. If you've got a uniform surcharge, the stresses don't start at zero. For vertical stresses, they start at the uniform surcharge, and they go up from there. You add the, ver the uniform surcharge all the way down. Um, in the case of the lateral pressures, you simply multiply, you know, the, um, they start out, you know, if you compute your horizontal, your vertical stresses, the horizontal stresses will just fall right along. They start out, for example, at K1 times the Q. But again, the key there is to, use, is to do your vertical stresses before you do your horizontal stresses or you will be sorry. Uh, so I was just using your vertical. If you do verticals, it just starts out at high pressure and it, 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 that pressure carries all the way down through the layers. Uniform surcharge is the simplest, but for some reason it's hard, it's, it's difficult to understand. One thing I have not seen in the FE cheat sheet at all is stuff like point loads and line loads behind the wall and strip loads and that sort of thing. I've not seen those. The only thing I've seen is the uniform surcharge. Now bring it up for that reason. There are three types of earth pressures you can have in a wall. Now that you've, you've figured out how to compute the horizontal pressures, you've got to know how to compute K. Um, there are three. Generally speaking, most of the emphasis in the cheat sheet is on triangle forces, and I'm going to do that same here. Um, for, at rest, where the wall does not move at all, the wall is motionless, or you're in a soul body, you've got two possibilities for k naught. One of them, for normally consolidated souls, you use Jackie's equation, 1 minus sine phi. 
Second of all, if you've got an over-consolidated, you simply multiply the second term by OCR to the sine phi power. Those are the only, that, that's how you, if you, and make sure they're asking you for at-rest earth pressures. Make sure you're, you're, they know you're asking you for active, passive, or at-rest. We're talking about at-rest now. And no matter which one of those you pick, the force, the, the force, the triangle force, which is located at a distance of h over 3 from the bottom of the triangle, is equal to the unit weight times the, uh, the square of the height times, in this case, k naught, the at-rest earth pressure, over 2. That's the resultant force on the wall. And you can see that illustrated very clearly in that diagram. Um, it is my, um, it is for ranking active earth pressures, um, the only type of act, ranking is the only earth pressure theory I have ever seen with, uh, in the FE exam. And it, it ranking pressure level backfill. The, the Ka is equal to tangent of pi over 4 in radians minus phi over 2 squared. Make sure your calculator is properly set one way or the other. Pi over 4, of course, is 45 degrees, and then minus phi over 2. And the P is equal to, uh, the force is equal to exactly the same as before, except instead of, of K0, it's now Ka. Other than that, there's no difference. But those are the only, which is a good thing, I think, for, um, I, I know that that would be a good thing to have, to you know, that'd be restricted to level backfill ranking. That will simplify that. For the passive pressures, the, the difference is, mathematically, is the fact that instead of pi over 4 minus p over 2, it's pi over 4 plus p over 2. KP and KA are reciprocals of each other in Rankine theory with level backfill. P again is the same form. One thing I will caution you about with any um, uh, any implement anytime you look at a problem, don't let the graphic that they present to you throw you in terms of you know whether they want active or passive pressures or at rest. The graphic you know, if you've got something, we've got a wall, and there's nothing on the other side, they, that may lull you and think, well, this is an active problem, but that's for illustrative purposes only. Make sure you read the problem, and make sure you know if it's active, passive, or at rest. One thing that, um, bearing capacity, um, Um, is this this is pretty much the straightforward the bearing capacity problems in the FE exam are pretty straightforward. Uh, they have the first term, the cohesion term, C times N sub C, the surcharge term, Q times N sub Q. Um, usually the surcharge of the base of the footing is equal as you see there. And, you know, Q applied. Yeah. There may be an Q applied. There probably won't be for the FE exam, but definitely the unit weight of the material above the base of the footing times the depth of the embedment is definitely your normal surcharge on those. And then the last one, the foundation soil weight term, which is 0.5 gamma times the footing width times N sub gamma. The three N factors, and I've put a chart here, but I noticed in the FE book that I'm using, that we're looking at, um, there was no chart. There has been in the past, but there is not one now. And actually, in the past, they actually used the same Ash Vesich Ashto chart that I use in Foundations. Um, by the way, this is one of the topics, uh, and it's not the only one now, that you really need to have gone through Foundations, or at least the first part of Foundations, to actually tackle. Um, the, the, the end values are all strictly um, functions of phi. They are not functions of anything else. You notice that they've got the equations for those. 
Uh, the FE book does not has never given equations, and I don't recommend most students use equations anyway, unless they're trying to construct a spreadsheet, and you're not going to be doing that in the FE exam anyway. So, um, brick fancy problems are fairly straightforward. The what you need to know is what the variables are. What is phi? That determines your end values. What is the base width? What is the um, um, the the um, the start, you know, the depth of embedment. What is the weight of the soil above that what depth of embedment? Um, you know, those things. Uh, you'll notice that this particular is the simple form, and it's for strip loads. And I think that's about all you see in the FE exam on bearing capacity. They're fairly straightforward. They should not be a problem as long as you're fairly familiar with what's going on. This is something which is fairly new and retaining walls. Um, and um, I want to make some comments about this. I'm not precisely sure how they've implemented, but I want to make a few. Uh, most of the, the equations you see over there on the, um, on the right are actually stuff that's in the... Um, um, are actually which, which, what's in the FE exam. First of all, first thing we want to note is um, the, uh, the fact that the factor of safety against anything is equal to resisting over driving, whether it be moments, like I say at the bottom, or forces. And you'll notice that the factor of safety, I added the factor of safety against overturning to that. That's simply equal to the, those moments are taken around the toe, and I'm the, there's actually that little chart there shows you what the toe is. They take the moments around the toe, and the sole moment, and the, um, uh, the, the driving, of course, are the sole on the back side of the wall, which, are, which the wall is trying to retain, that's the name retaining walls. And the driving and the resisting forces are either, you've got, uh, the resisting moments is mostly the weight of the structure itself plus whatever soil is trapped. And that's the, o that, that's the overturning FS. Um, and um, one thing that they do is, there are a few things that they emphasize in the notes. One of them is that the maximum stress on the base is that what you see at, is at the toe and the Q max is equal to the, the equation shown is the weight of the, the total weight of the weight of the wall um, over you know and um, you know it gives you the total weight plus the whatever uh, friction the soil exerts on the wall which is PV over B times 1 plus 60 over B. And that's the maximum stress. That's that uh, the, the linear, and you can actually see that in the cam, in all three of those charts actually show that, the Q max. And that's the one that they actually emphasize in the notes. Factor of safety against sliding, again, W, the weight of the whole weight trap weight, you know, the wall plus whatever the soils is. Piece of V, which is the weight, which is the, the downward force um, the soil exerts on the side of the wall, on, on, on the wall, um, and, um, and then the tangent of delta. Now, delta is the frictional angle between the soil and the, and the base of the, of the wall, and they give some interesting looking formulas, uh, K1 times V1. Um, which and K1 or K2 can vary from one half to two thirds. <coughs> they also have for those for C sub A, um, which is the fact you know if you've got some cohesion in there, they have a K2 times C2, which um, C2 is actually the cohesion of the foundation soil, and um, um, so in other words that both the delta and the C A are factors of V and C respectively. C2, as I show you there, is the cohesion of the foundation soil. 
Uh, one important thing that they're pro they might throw at you is the eccentricity issue. And that is, um, uh, the eccentricity criteria E is equal to D minus B over 2. And you see there that you've got ways of computing each. First of all, you, they show you how to compute the location of the resultant. Um, and that resultant is the distance from the toe to the point where the, 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 all the forces basically, from a static standpoint, gather, are basically collected. And um, that D, and then you D minus B over 2 is your eccentricity. Eccentricity for soils, foundations based in soils, must be less than B over 6. Otherwise, you get lift off. So those, um, and, and I, I spent a fair amount of time in uh, foundations discussing this issue. This is the first time I have seen retaining walls actually um, mentioned in their booklet. Sliding slope stability. Um, the book you have has a pile of dirt um, in it, and basically, um, as the, that pile of dirt has a weight, what the diagram shows is an infinite, but basically what I'm doing is looking, whether you do it infinitely or finitely, and really to do it finitely simplifies the problem a little bit, the driving force, T, is equal to the weight of the soil mass, whatever that weight is, and you have, and times the sine of beta, and beta is the angle of the slope. And the normal force, which is what the, the, the pile of dirt exerts on the, on, on, the, on the parent soil, is that weight times cosine of B. Um, the resisting force is, is equal to the cohesion times the length of the pile of dirt, um, plus the N, which is the normal force, times the tangent of phi, which basically mobilize, for cohesion of soils, mobilizes whatever friction there is in the soil. And the factor is HG is equal to S over T. That's the usual, what we just saw with retaining walls. Um, these are fairly straightforward. Basically what you're looking at here is, you go back to statics, and there's a block on a slope. When we did, we, we, I used the block on a slope analogy to illustrate soil friction. Cohesion adds a little glue to that particular interface. But basically that's what you're talking about. You basically lift up one end of the slope, kind of like a board with a block on it, and basically eventually, if it's steep enough, the block will slide down. And that's exactly what we're trying to prevent in slope stability. But, so that's all this is about, really and truly. That, that's all this is about. Whether you have an infinite slope, finite slope, whatever, or just a pile of dirt on the side of a hill, that's it. These are fairly straightforward. And you can actually derive the equations, and I do that um, from... Uh, on you know this on, on in between the finite case and the infinite case. Now we come to the last topic, and that is soil classification. Soil classification is one of the trickiest, and because basically there's a process of elimination from left to right. Let's start with the unified system. Now, this is what I present in class. The, um, um, I've, I've had more than one different forms of these, but they're all pretty much the same. And you need to be familiar with it. But basically, this is how you start. You start on the left column. The left column has five different options. Let's put aside the organic soils for a minute. If they tell you it's organic, then you have to classify it that way. But there are gravel, sand, silts, and clays, and silt. And then, um, well, the, the silts, and the first silts and clays are the lean silts. And the second set of silts and clays are the fat silts and clays. And the difference between the two is liquid limitless. But, but before that, the first thing you have to do is to split it between the top two and the 
bottom two, leaving out the organic soils. In other words, you have to decide, first of all, if more than 50% is retained in the number 207 above. In other words, if most of the particle weight is in coarse grain particles, uh, or particles which are larger than the number 207, they are cohesionless soils. They are either a gravel or a sand. Fine grain soils, if most of them pass that and they're smaller than that, they are fine grain soils. You miss that particular juncture, you're toast in the unified system. Once you get past that, then um, you get into whether or not, first of all, whether they're clean gravels or clean fine. The gravels and the sands basically work the same. There's no difference between the two except that the gravels, more, most of the coarse fraction is retained to the number 4-7. I've got a pie chart method that you could use uh, and I'll explain it on my website how to fix that, how to, how to visualize that. But if most of the coarse fraction is retained the number four sieve, it's a gravel. If it goes through, it's the sand. Let's just use the let's use the gravels for an example. If there's less than five percent fines, less than five percent passing the number um, two hundred, it's a clean gravel. And we use our uh, Cu and C sub C, um, as you see in Note E. We talked about those earlier to determine whether it's well graded or poorly graded. If it has more than 12, then um, you have to figure out what the fines classification is. Um, and I want to talk about that in just a minute, how that works. And you either they're either a silty gravel or a clay gravel. And that's pretty much it for the co for the um, um, for the cohesion of the soils. The sands are done exactly the same way. In the case of uh, silts and clays, um, you need to uh, the um, if it's uh, an organic, you know, you've got a little bit different situation. But let's just stick with the inorganics for a second. If the plasticity in the grays and plots on or above the A line, then it's a lean clay, and then it's an ML, it's a lean silt. Or, well, we usually don't call it lean, but we, we didn't realize what it really amounts to. It's an ML, no matter how you slice it. Um, and that's um, with, uh, and silting, and with uh, uh, fat clays and elastic cells or fat cells or how you want to call them, um, if PI plots above the A line, or it's a it is a fat clay, and it's below the line, it's a it's a uh, elastic silt or a fat silt or whatever you want to call it. Um, so you ask, how do you do that? There, A line is clearly labeled. You take the plast, you'll be given the plasticity index and the liquid limit. You will plot that to a point on there and if you're not too sh I'm not I don't think that they do the I think you need to do it get used to doing it graphically for the FE exam uh, I don't believe they give you the equation of the A-line if it's below the A-line you make one decision if it, 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 you, there's because they're silts if it's above the A-line they're clays this eliminates having to do further Hydrometer. This actually limits you do a hydrometer test. So that's how you do it. And of course, there's the other conditions. The only thing you need to make do some practice to make sure that you're doing this properly. But that, in a nutshell, is the um, unified soil classification system. And you've got a lot of notes. And a lot of those it lo looks complicated, and it can be. Well, the really the trickiest one is it, are on the cohesion of soils between five and twelve the dual classification. And I actually have an example of a dual classification uh, which I actually presented in class and it's on, on my website again which you can go through and see how that happened. 
Um, but um, and again, you classify basically once you get if you've got any gravel with or sand with more than five percent fines, you have to basically classify the fines and then go back and classify the um, uh, and then you go back and use that to finish classifying the soles. One thing I will make note of some of you will have in have will go in to a classification problem and you will see um, plasticity index and liquid limits and you will stick it your little you, you will pin it somewhere on that chart and you will say well this is a ML or OL MH or it's CL or, or, or CH and that's it no don't do that you can do that uh, somewhat if you have a Co cohesive soil. In other words, if you've got a fine grain soil, you could, that's pretty much the way it works, except for the, you know, for the inorganic uh, clays, lean clays, where it's got a little, you've got an extra, well, you've got that um, thing at the bottom um, down there where CLML is. you got to watch. That's a dual classification. But that only classifies the fines. If you've got a, a, a soil which is say, you know, 10% or 20%, only 20% fines, that may determine whether you've got a silty or a clay sand or gravel, but it's not going to determine classically. Don't just use the, um, my, the, um, that as your guide. Last but not least is the Ashto system. Basically, it's a left to right thing where you start on the on the left and you do by a process of elimination. You, you're armed usually with, depending on the soil, with liquid limit, plasticity index, basically the same information and the gradation analysis, 7% passing the number 10, the number 40, the number 200. And you just go until you find a classification that fits everything. And I mean everything. And that's it. And then you stop. Sometimes it can get tricky. And the, and the example I gave in class, uh, the first one is a good example of a, of a soil which really kind of plays on the edge. But... Um, that's Ashto. You go straight left to right and you stop when you get a, when you find something that meets the requirements. Um, there's also the group index. The group index is, it, th this slide pretty much explains everything about the group index. Um, the um, group indices, first of all, are never negative. That's the first thing. Second of all, um, if you get a negative value for GI off, off of that equation, it's zero. The group index, uh, cac, you know, you, you don't have decimal group numbers. They're all integers. Um, group indices really only come up with soil and with cohesive types of soils. And usually, and, and that makes sense because, you know, the liquid limit and the plasticity index drives the group index, which are most prominent in cohesion soils. So that is the, pretty much the group index, and they've got the group index. And then you also will note that the partial group index uh, drops out um, at the end. So that's pretty much it. Um, for this presentation. Um, my website has got, as you know, has got plenty of materials on the sub uh, on all these topics. And once again, always thanks for watching and God bless.